you are now experiencing the, the, the Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. Hey everybody, welcome to The Digital Life. On today's show, I discuss photography with Chase McCurdy. Now, I came across Chase's work while watching the Travel Channel's web series, The Perfect Shot. I learned so much about shooting landscapes from Chase that I had to have him on this show. The amazing thing as you listen to our conversation is that you can really tell how passionate Chase is about photography. And it's something that we all should strive for in doing something that we love day in and day out. So without further ado, here's my conversation with ace photographer Chase McCurdy. Okay, we're talking to Chase McCurdy. How are you today? I'm good, Kevin. How about yourself? I'm fine. You know, I was doing some research uh, on you, and I came across your Tumblr page. You had a tab that says Rule Number 76, so I clicked <laughs> on it. <laughs> it's like the most original thing I've ever seen on, a, on any type of website, because I think, okay, it must be some type of tutorial thing. But no, it only, the only thing it had on there was no excuses and play like a champion. So where did that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, where did that come from? Um, well, that's a, that's a line from the movie Wedding Crashers um, that always stuck with me. They're going over, you know, some of the rules of wedding crashing, and I heard that, and it kind of stuck with me. Um, and then in terms of photography, it sticks because through the lessons I've learned in studying the craft and studying those greats that I admire, um, the circumstances don't matter, cameras don't matter, Lenses don't matter. Um, all that matters is capturing what you're intending to capture. Before we go into cameras, Wedding Crashes might be the only film, maybe I saw Pulp Fiction. Every time it's on TV, I just stop and watch it. Oh, you have to. It's a classic. You got to. Okay, so how did you get into photography? Oh, man. Well, you know, like a lot of us, when I was younger, um, I messed around with skateboarders. Um, I used to be a skater. And I was never quite as good as the, the guys I rode with. So at one point, I just started to film them and, and photograph them, make little videos and, and stuff like that. And then as, you, as I got a little older, um, you know, kind of went away for a bit. But, uh, you know, in college, I started picking the camera back up. And it, it came to be the one thing that kind of just seemed natural. You know, if I wanted to escape from classwork or escape from studying, I would go take pictures. I would get up at sunrise, you know, to take pictures on campus, um, but I would have a very hard time waking up for a 10 a.m. class. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> kind of yeah. thing. Um, so you know that in, uh, when you start doing those things, you start to realize this is pretty important to you. And then one story that, I'll, that always holds true um, is my, my father, his parents' house, um, was robbed when they were younger. And one thing that was taken were a great deal of uh, family photo albums. So I think I only have one, maybe two pictures of my dad when he was in his teenage years. And uh-huh. consciously, I think that had a very big impact on on me and the importance of pictures in my life. Um, and I didn't really start to understand mm-hmm. that until I got older. How did that affect your dad when he lost all those photos? Um, you know, it, it's rough. He's all, he always told me that that's one of the other things that, that he hates most about having grown up and, and not having much to share with, with me about what he looked like, you know, at my age as I was growing up or, you know, if I was 13 or 14 and I wanted to compare myself to a picture of my dad, I didn't really have one to, uh, to do. So that was rough. And he always said it was, it was very hard. Um, but at the end of the day, you still have him. So the picture, the picture is hard to not have, but lucky to have have the dad either way. That's true. Do you deal mainly with digital, or do you mess around with film as well? I, I mean, I I play with both. Um, digitally, I use a, a Canon, a 5D, um, a camera that I actually cannot stand taking out in public. Um, so my daily shooter is a simple like Nikon F FM that I got for really cheap at my local camera store. Uh, that I shoot black and white film just because it's much smaller and easier to, to take around. So how come you don't uh, like taking out your Canon during the day or in public? It's just far too big of a camera. Um, you know, as soon as I can afford it, ideally I'll be moving on to a uh, a Leica. You know, I, I don't I, – I enjoy the, the technical aspects of the Canon and what it allows in terms of photo quality, but I just find when a camera is that large and intrusive, it really just takes a, away a lot from the experience of photographing 
um, everything from daily scenes to portraits of other people. Yeah, when we first started a conversation, you mentioned it doesn't matter what type of lens you have or what type of camera that you have. And I think a lot of people automatically think, well, I need to get a Canon 5D or I need to get a Rebel. And those are fine cameras, but you don't need to get those high-end cameras, especially if you don't know how to use them effectively. No, I mean, you're you're right. You know, when I first, um, when I first moved to Los Angeles and, and left my very cushy, very good job as a young 23-year-old professional and just kind of gave it all up to hop on a friend's couch to be a photographer. You know, I really had no idea what I was doing. I ended up buying a 5D Mark III with savings because I thought, okay, you want to be a pro, then that's what you need. Um, so I fell under the same spell, you know, and I first would reach out to other photographers whose work I liked the first question would be like a lot of other amateurs. Oh, what camera are you using? What lens are you using? What kind of editing are you doing? And I was mm-hmm. really missing the bigger picture of photography as a as a craft. Uh, who were your mentors back then? Oh, it was a bunch of guys who just and ladies could be a lady who gave you a lot of great advice along the way. You know, there's one photographer in particular who has been a great influence to me. Um, his name is Lucas Passmore. He is a fashion photographer here in Los Angeles. Um, he's really the only major mentor I've had that I've worked with for months and months, and he's the first photographer that really allowed me to work for him for free. Um, you know, he's highly influential, and we had these conversations. But a lot of this knowledge and things that I've picked up have just come from really studying, you know, everything about photography. I realized very quickly that I had no idea what I was doing, and I was at one point just another person picking up a camera calling myself a photographer. Once I made that realization, I really took the time to step back and put myself through courses in photography, from everything from the history of the of the form to studying the masters to studying the technical aspects, to studying film, to looking at cinematography for their use of light things like that um, along the way. It's fascinating that you said, I didn't know what I was doing, and I went back to study this. So how long did it take for you when you went back to study this stuff when it finally started clicking in for you? You know, I, I don't have an exact amount of time. What I can tell you is that I, it clicked that I was doing the right thing and that photography was the right thing for me. When I started to read more of the, the Cartier-Bresson and things that he said, or things that a Helmut Newton would say when it comes to photography, or Nick Young would say um, in regards to, you know, the camera is not really has nothing to do with it. You know, when it comes to this is some a way to, to tell a story or to capture true human emotion or to take an image in your head and make it happen in real life with the use of models and and clothing and style and or working with a designer to bring their vision to life. Those are the things that really um, gave me the quick moment. Nothing to do with the technical side of photography gave me the quick. Um, I only realized it when I knew that the space that I looked at it in an emotional sense was the way that people that I look up to, to um, in photography also look at it. Yeah, I noticed that in that Travel Channel video because, you know, you, you guys were lining up a shot at Red Rock and you said, well, let's try this look. Like, let's not go for the obvious. And is that what you try to do when, you, when you're taking your shots? You try to not, to t- not take a traditional shot or maybe try, try to find something that other people don't see? Um, you know, it depends. A lot of times you, you don't want, you know, an obvious. You don't want something that just anyone can do. But it's also challenging yourself. Like a lot of times, like in that situation, okay, that was the first shot we had. But you know what? Let's take a step back. And before we choose to take a shot, let's see what else there is. Maybe this first one was the best one. Maybe the second one is better. Um, and that's, in that, that challenge is really what, 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 it, what I go for. It's kind of pushing, pushing yourself to what is there. And, and pushing yourself without first, okay, let me take a couple pictures here and then move and get a couple more pictures in kind of that, that not to say lazy fashion, but taking advantage of digital fashion. Um, because you start doing that, then no, you're not taking the time to really 
properly compose and expose the shot as if you're shooting on a film roll and only have five shots available. I notice you use Photoshop, but, you know, you just use a little bit to kind of add some texture to it. I mean, how often do you use editing tools, or do many times you just take a photo and say, oh, okay, this looks pretty nice, we'll just keep it as is? Um, you know, it depends on the shot. There's times when I like it, how it comes out of the camera. But, you know, for a majority of my photos, I, I use the uh, the combination of Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, I'm very staunch in that I do not like to do much retouching, especially if I'm shooting people in Photoshop. And it, it upsets me sometimes when I'm working with a client or, or an actor or a model. Um, and those things you get it, but, you know, they, they really want a very Photoshop image. I'm the self-proclaimed photographer that hates Photoshop. Um, but I love what it does in terms of color correcting, curves, and my contrast and brightness and my levels. Those things I thoroughly enjoy, especially with my black and white work. Um, but I don't like to do much outside of that. I don't like to take things out. I don't like to put things in. You know, I can keep it to very simple, very simple editing. Yeah, I also wanted to ask you about your black and white shots, uh, especially your concert footage shots. My color shots are great. But there seems to be like a depth or something uh, when you shoot those like black and white shots. I can't really describe it, but it just seems like it seems kind of retro, but it's not retro. It just it just seems like you feel like you're at that concert when I see those shots. Well, um, first, thank you. Uh, I really do appreciate that. I mean, that just comes from um, experience, and when I say experience, not experience in shooting, that helps. Um, but life experience, you know, I, I was in band as a kid, but my, my best friend um, and much of the, the same person that pushed me to follow my dream and come to Los Angeles is a guy by the name of Alex Marshall. Um, he's in a, he's in a, he was in a band called The Cab and is now embarking on a solo career. But, you know, we would go back to being kids, like 15 or 16 years old, I remember first seeing him start out working in garage band or playing his piano and taking pictures um, to now seeing him in actual recording studios or playing in arenas, you know, and what that taught me is the passion behind music, the deep conversations we have about the touring life and how hard it can really be to be a traveling and working and touring musician, understanding the blood, sweat, and tears that go into, you know, first making and recording that work and then to rehearsals and then when an artist really is out there on stage um, completely vulnerable sharing their their art their passion their innermost um, feelings on stage to thousands of people you know I think that really having an understanding and you know me wanting to capture that and wanting to give that make that image for the fans, for the people that make it possible for the artist to do it and for me to capture that artist, I think is really what allows that to come through. You know, I really honestly try to, I tell musicians, as long as they put their passions on stage, I don't have to do too much or press a button. What I would love to do, um, if just one time, is to tell the story of, a, uh, a music tour, to be that photographer for an extended tour with that artist, that band, those roadies, um, those guitar techs, everyone, those you know, those tour managers, everyone that has to come together to make a music tour successful. I would love to be able to just document and tell that story of a uh, of a full tour. I think that would be just one of the greatest experiences. One one of the greatest honors that one can have as a photographer. That seems to be a lost art because I don't think people really understand. Like, the real story aren't really the videos. The real story is really behind the scenes, how people are just by, you know, just how they are just sitting around talking. Like, you know, I just saw a picture of, like, Mick Jagger and George Harrison and Billy Preston. <laughs> just a casual shot. And I think if you did something like that, if more people did something like that, I think it kind of gives you a sense of, of having a, a bigger look for music because right now it just seems like it's just very consumer-driven. It is. And, you know, I, and it just comes to getting to know those people, you know, those, those faces, those names. Um, 
you know, a lot of times now, a lot of music photographers, they're very just concerned about who they shoot. Um, they'll take a bunch mm-hmm. of pictures, and hopefully they get a couple here and there. You know, what I don't see a lot of, I see a lot of photographers in the photo pit or on stage is people stepping back and enjoying the music for a moment. You know, would you ever come across me shooting, especially at the Sayers Club where I'm the house photographer, um, but you'll see maybe snap a picture here, snap a photo there, but I spend, you know, at least 30 seconds to a minute of each song that's being played just kicking back and and feeling the vibe, listening to the lyrics, um, observing, looking at the drummer, looking at the bassist, looking at the guitarist, the, the singer, and seeing what kind of little chords they have taking the time to really understand and appreciate those individuals who you're capturing. So I've never been to Los Angeles. I have friends who live out there. But from the photography standpoint, because there's so many photographers out there, how do you make yourself stand out? I mean, is, is social media a, a major part of that? Or is it just maybe it's just, you know, you just put your work out there and, and just knock on doors and hand out flyers? I mean, how does that work when you try to really make your mark as a photographer out there in L.A.? Um, I mean, a lot of hard work and just, just practicing, you know, I, I don't really, I never really thought about trying to make myself stand out. Um, it really hit home when it came down to, okay, well, here's what you can do. You can just take pictures and be like everyone else, or you can take the photos you want to take, edit the way you want to edit, do things that, that you want to do that you're happy with put them out there, and allow the rest to happen. Um, you know, a lot of hard work and faith. I put my time into studying the craft, um, into learning. You know, I don't go out and party. I don't um, spend too much time hanging out. I really don't have the most exciting of personal of a personal life because every moment that I have is dedicated to improving in some way. And you know, that improvement comes in terms of watching documentaries on photographers or watching documentaries on music um, or watching documentaries on the fashion industry and fashion designers because that's the kind of photographer that I that I am and want to be is a music and fashion photographer. So I'm literally spending all of my time between those three genres, between learning and understanding all three of those. So those are and I work during the week, a full-time job. So um, it's just it's just the, the continued struggle to just improve, to know that I will do nothing but be a photographer, know that nothing else is right but to be a photographer. And that, that's pretty much how you start to, I guess, build a name or stand out. I really don't know any other, any other way. No doubt. Is there a few documentaries that you could recommend for people who want to learn more about photography? Are there a few documentaries that you would uh, like to suggest? Oh, of, of course. Um, immediately off the top of my mind, um, In Darkness and Light, uh, it's about Richard Abaddon, one of um, the photographers I look up to the most. A lot of it because of one singular quote that I heard, among many others. But one thing that I, that he said that has particularly stuck to me, and, um, you know, I have a white background, I have the person I'm photographing, and I have this thing that happens between us. Um, that stuck with me greatly. So, In Darkness and Light, and then Helmet by June. So this is a documentary of Helmet Newton, and it's all um, handheld camcorder footage that his wife June shot when they were together. And I liked that because it's a very personal look at his work and him as a person. You know, who are you going to be more open with other than the person you choose to to be with for the rest of your life? And then Bill Cunningham, his recent documentary about his work and his appreciation for what he does and what, what he loves really also stuck with me. And that one be much because of it's not about money. He tried to refuse to take as much money as possible. He just was focused on doing what he wanted to do and what he was in photographing, what he was interested in photographing and nothing more or less. Fantastic. So for people like myself uh, who are amateur photographers, because I have my Android and my point and shoot Lumix camera. So for people like myself, what tips would you give beginners trying to learn how to be a photographer? 
you know, have fun. You know, uh, take a step back and don't get so engrossed in the picture itself. Get more engrossed in the moment or the the landscape that you may find yourself in or the person that you're taking the picture of. Ask them one or two more questions before taking a picture. Um, you know, get fall in love with everything that is going to make that picture that picture. You know, there's a – you have to remember, like, when you – pick up your camera or phone to make an image of something, there's a reason why. There's something that went off in your mind to say, hey, I want to take a picture of that. So try to remember what that is before taking the shot and then and then take the shot. And I think if anything else, that connection that you have with the photo will make it your favorite <laughs> each time. And it'll it'll come through in the picture. And uh what types of apps or gadgets do you use on a regular basis? You know, in terms of photography, I use uh, the Visco, V-S-C-O, a lot for photo editing. Um, I really enjoy how I can make my black and white iPhone pictures look um, with that app. You know, a lot of Instagram, which I will say I post a lot of pictures I take with my, you know, digital camera, my 5D on Instagram, but I thoroughly love Instagram for the simple fact that it makes me compose in the one-by-one square format, for lack of a better term at this moment, or aspect, excuse me. You know, I, I think a squared image is very unique and very cool. And Instagram, one of my biggest daily users, um, is pretty responsible for me thinking that way. And then, you know, every day I have a camera of some sort, you know, I'm going to take a picture of something. Not a day goes by, but I don't, it's not something. And, uh, and yeah, my backpack. My backpack is always with me, and that's got pretty much my life in it, from cameras to laptop to hard drives to pretty much everything I need at any moment's notice. My my backpack is there. Uh, what type of laptop do you have? I use a uh, MacBook Pro, the 15-inch uh, Retina for everything. Let's go back to your dad for a second. What does your dad think about you as a photographer now? Because like you said, you was trying to find yourself, and now you find your passion. You can feel it through this interview that you love photography. So how did your dad think about you now? Or is there a specific shot that he saw of yours that made him say, wow, this is fantastic? You know, I am one of the luckiest people in the world, um, I will say, because I've had nothing but love and support from my friends, my family, and especially my parents. Um, The first thing my dad said when I told him I was leaving Las Vegas, where I'm from, and I was going to go to L.A., I wanted to be a photographer, he was like, good. That's going to be something good for you. Um, and a really cool story, a, a photographer, a friend that I was connected with um, through a mutual friend from Las Vegas, a guy that we had met up and, you know, talked to photography a couple times, a great, um, a great landscape photographer by the name of Vincent Lowry. Um, he gave me a metal print of a photo that I took um, it's the photos on my website. I'm not sure if you've seen it. It's uh, of a desert road, a road in a desert. Um, it's pretty straight, going up a hill, um, kind of cropped in a, in a panoramic type viewpoint. The photographer surprised me with that print, and I gave it to my dad. And I went to his office at work, and it's proudly displayed front and center. The first thing you see when you step into his office. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm I'm probably one of the luckiest people, one of the most blessed people on the face of this earth to be able to say that I have friends and family that have supported me undoubtedly, unflinchingly, um, as they have. That's fantastic. Well, Chase McCurdy, thank you for the conversation. If people need to find you or look at your work, where can they go? Um, they can go to my website, uh, Chase R. McCurdy, M-C-C-U-R-D-Y dot com. And from there, you can find me on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Everything is pretty easy. A um, little marketing note, you know, try to keep all of your your URL and your, your tags and your handles for all social media the same. So everything is Chase Armour 30. Yeah, tell me about Tumblr. How did you decide on using Tumblr as far as, like, promoting your pictures? I sat on Tumblr because of the back end. I like the user experience, and I like the appreciation for photography that I find on Tumblr. And when I say pre-vision for photography, it may not be the most sophisticated at times, but people, if they, if they like an image they see on Tumblr, they'll share it, and they'll like it. 
and there's a real community there um, of photo lovers. And, you know, Tumblr is easy to share. It's very simple, and you can make your page look how you'd like for it to look. I'm a kind of a design freak, so to be able to make something clean and, and easy to look at was, was, was key for me. All right. Well, thanks for the conversation, Chase. And do me a favor, shake your father's hand for me, because <laughs> he's like he's a great man. And, and, and give your mama a hug, too. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for having me, Kevin. I, I appreciate um, the time to be able to share my, my thoughts and views on, on something so special to me. I want to thank Chase McCurdy for being a great guest on The Digital Life. Make sure you check out his work at ChaseRMcCurdy.com. That's ChaseRMcCurdy.com. Also, be sure to follow him on all social networks at Chase R. McCurdy. That's Chase R. McCurdy. Before I go, I have an Instagram question for you. Switched it up this time. I have an Instagram question for you. Tag me at Kevin Lockett and give me a photographer that you really admire on Instagram. The person could be a professional or amateur. It doesn't matter. But tag me at Kevin Lockett with a name of a photographer that you really enjoy. All right, everybody. It's the Digital Life. I'm Kevin Lockett. And I'm out. The Digital Life with Kevin Lockett. 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 Lockett.